Okay, so uh, yeah, I'm here to talk about unconditional basic income mostly, but also I'm going to go through a little bit of the past uh, as well. Um, it was nice that Moshi actually did some of this already, so I'll be able to go through this a little bit quicker and cover basic income a bit more. So yeah, so the three big questions, how do we work right now and how has it changed over time? I think it's really important to look uh, at the immediate past as far as just decades instead of even centuries. Um, and I'm gonna get into what is unconditional basic income and uh, why should we uh, look into it so closely. <clears throat> so Moshi kind of covered this, but uh, again, when we're looking at the changes that have occurred in the way that we work, uh, I want to look at this through a, a few different lenses to get a better idea at this. So this first lens is just looking at um, our compensation for the work that we've been doing. So for the longest time, as productivity rose, people's wages went up, and that stopped. So really, essentially, well, many, many people have not gotten a raise for decades now. And it just it doesn't make any sense that that here we are being more and more productive and people are actually having a harder and harder time living. Uh, this is looking at the lens through, again, the, uh, the skill changes. I think this is really interesting just to, uh, to focus on. There's three kind of main things here that decade after decade, low-skilled jobs have increased and decade after decade, high-skilled jobs have decreased except for a recent uptick towards the top uh, recently. And also, I think the most important is that the middle has been expanding, kind of a picture like a, a donut with a growing hole. And this is this, this disappearance of these uh, middle-skilled jobs. Another lens to look through is chopping up jobs into uh, routine versus non-routine tasks and cognitive versus manual within this. So if you look at this, around 1990, routine work just flatlined. So you can really see automation's effect here because again, when it comes to tasks that need to be done over and over and over and over again, machines have been really good at that and that does not require AI. AI is now coming to the picture and that's gonna be able to handle the non-routine stuff. So you expect to see that to flatline as well. It's also important to look at this through a lens of how people are working as far as time goes. So for the longest time, we really had careers. You could have a full-time job you work in this job for decades. You have benefits, you look forward to a pension. It, there is a real sense of stability to that. And over time, we, we see this kind of a growth in, in part-time jobs through, through contractual, through on-demand work. Um, and you were able to chop up these tasks into smaller and smaller uh, chunks. And as a result, technology allows us to essentially work on demand. Like it made sense to hire someone for 40 hours per week um, and they would just sit around for a while if you didn't need them, but they were there. But now thanks to technology, it's actually we're able to figure out, well, we don't really need this person, but we need this many for this amount of time. We'll hire these part-time workers. Oh, we'll just get a contract. We'll hire this person for six months. You know, just do like a, just one project. You have website designers designing one side at a time. And then even you've got something newer, like Amazon Turk is the system where people can just spend essentially seconds doing very small tasks and getting paid very small amounts of money. And so if you look at this, if you look at this through time, it's also really interesting to see that from 2005 to 2015, we created nine million new jobs in the US. We also created nine million new alternative forms of work jobs. So essentially, this century, all of the jobs we've been creating are these forms of alternative work. It's not these long, full-time careers. And another aspect of this is that because we've been chopping up work into smaller and smaller increments, that people's incomes are varying much more greatly than before. Uh, a recent analysis of this showed that if you look at just the bottom quintile in the U.S., um, 
three quarters of that bottom quintile, their incomes are varying now month to month by 30%. So there's a lot of insecurity in this new work. So also just look at the, just the present of work right now. Only 33% of workers are actually engaged by the work that they're doing. 15% uh, of is that worldwide. So most people are not engaged by their work. They're not interested in it. It's also interesting how here productivity has been rising decade after decade, and yet the amount of hours that we're working has been rising recently too, and this has happened since 1980. So for the longest time, this was dipping downwards, and now it's jumped back up. So it, that doesn't make any sense. Why are we needing to, to clock in more hours when we're more productive? Now, even there have been surveys done to look at, well, how many hours of work are people actually doing per day? It's interesting that there's so many people that report that they're, they're really the amount of work that they do that's actual work is three to six hours. This is not, you're, you're not really doing eight hours of work. You don't need to be there for eight hours. And then David Graeber has put a really interesting twist on this recently with his, uh, his definition of bullshit jobs. And multiple surveys since he wrote about this have looked into this, and 37 to 40% of workers believe that their job is entirely pointless, and they have to pretend that it isn't. And at the same time as all of this work is going on that we may not even necessarily need to do, there's a whole lot of unpaid work going on in the US that's extremely important. It's valued as exceeding one trillion dollars annually. You know, most of this is, is care work, but it's also you know, open source work, uh, just volunteering of all kinds. So what if we decoupled work from income? This is the unconditional basic income. The unconditional basic income is essentially a investment in people through the form of a, a universal dividend. So it's unconditional, meaning you receive it without any requirements. Essentially, you, you would get it as a, as a citizen or a resident, but essentially, you keep it no matter what, no matter how much income you earn on top of it, it's still yours. It's universal, everybody gets it. It's individual, it doesn't go to the household or the head of the household, it goes to every person in a household. It's income, it's currency, it's not benefits in kind, it's not food stamps, it's income, it's money that you can spend however you wish. And it's a, a basic amount. You need to essentially look at lifting people above the poverty level it's to cover your basic needs. This isn't a new idea. Milton Friedman and Martin Luther King Jr. were talking about this in the 1960s. So how many ideas out there really do we come to where someone like Milton Friedman and someone like Martin Luther King Jr are both in agreement on the idea. The Alaska dividend has existed since 1982, which I think is the closest to UBI anywhere in the world. Every year since 1982, everyone in Alaska has received a dividend on average of around $1,000 per year. Uh, the highest amount that it was was over 3,000 or Sarah Palin. And this is for every member in a household. So if you're getting $2,000 in a year, you have a five-person household, that's $10,000. That's your floor that everyone gets in, in Alaska. Let's even look at this as far back as Thomas Paine with agrarian justice, when he argued that it is not a charity but a right, not bounty but justice that I am pleading for. The present state of civilization is as odious as it is unjust. He proposed that the payments, as already stated, be made to every person, rich or poor. He believed that because all of the, the land was essentially owned by all people together, that the owners of the land owed a ground rent, and that rent should be paid to everyone. Now, this idea is actually gaining a lot of momentum uh, around the world. There are already countries experimenting with this. There are countries seriously looking into this, and there are countries uh, that have already tested it. So right now, there's a two-year experiment going on in Finland. 
uh, that will be ending at the end of this year. Canada is doing a three-year experiment that they just started. And uh, uh, you've got experiments, you've got a 12-year experiment right now in Kenya that Give Directly is doing. We've got um, there will be an experiment in the US by Y Combinator. The, the details are not concrete yet, but it's looking to be about a five-year experiment in two different states. And India is getting really seriously looking into this, and it's expected that they'll start something within the next couple of years. But there's just a lot of action going on around here, around the, around the world. And of course, each time something else happens, then it, it, it excites other countries to look into this as well. Now, there's a, there's a lot of, there's a, a misunderstanding, too, about negative income tax, basic income, how different or the same that they are. So to start off with the negative income tax, you're essentially taking money from the top and you're transferring it from the bottom and middle. So this is a varying payment based on how much that you earn. But it's, a, it's identical to a UBI uh, at the zero earning point where you earn the full amount. Now the thing is, it's the same thing. UBI is a, is a net transfer. So if you see it's the same amount, you're st if you design it in such a way, you're transferring 900 billion from the top to the, the bottom and middle essentially. Except the difference is that everyone is paying to receive something. So through that way, you've got net payers and net receivers. Yes, Bill Gates will receive a basic income, but he will pay more in additional taxes than he already pays right now. And it also makes sense to say eliminate a, uh, you know, a $50,000 tax credit that Bill Gates is already getting right now. That why are we giving billionaires a $50,000 tax credit? Well, let's just give them $12,000 cash instead of that. Now, if you look at the, uh, the analysis of this, see what are the effects, say, on, on tax rates per, per quintile? And if you break this down, you see that, that uh, the way that I would do this, say, to, uh, designing a poverty line basic income so that you're essentially lifting everybody, you scale it so that uh, each child receives $4,000, and this would actually eliminate poverty in the U.S because poverty scales by household, you would actually reduce the tax burdens of essentially the bottom 80%. You, you, the crossover point is at around the 80% mark, and you would only need to raise the taxes of those above that around 10%. So this isn't like this huge amount of money that people tend to talk about it as. I call it the napkin math n number, to think of this as like a $3 trillion uh, uh, requirement. It's not that large, especially if you uh, eliminate existing programs that are no longer necessary. And I don't mean all programs, I mean the programs that make sense to eliminate, such as uh, food stamps is a great example. TANF is another good example. And so the is estimate that I have uh, estimated is around 300 to 600 billion, depending on the decisions that we make on how we design the program. So there's a lot of decisions to make. How much will the basic income be? What kind of taxes are we going to do? Uh, what are the amounts of those taxes? What are the mix of these? How do we reform the welfare system? How do we reform the, the, uh, uh, the tax system itself as far as credits and deductions and stuff goes? There's a lot of decisions to make. But it's not as expensive as people think it is. And also, like when I put the asterisk up here, the cost of child poverty is over $1 trillion per year. So if we eliminated child poverty and we paid an additional, say, $500 billion to pay for it, we're essentially $500 billion ahead with much better outcomes. There's a lot of pieces of the puzzle that's already out there. So here's a list of the experiments uh, that have already been done that have shown a lot of interesting data. And I, here's a, just kind of a summary of the most interesting effects uh, as far as I'm concerned. So there's no, no social stigma was observed in the Canadian Minkum experiment. Uh, primary earners spend more time job searching. This is interesting because people look at this as, oh my gosh, uh, let's say this experiment showed that, that primary earners reduced their, their working hours by 5%. Well, 
if you actually look at what, the way that worked out, is that they didn't actually reduce the amount of time. What they did is they actually spent more time between jobs looking for the next job, and so if you totaled up the hours over the whole year, they worked less. But I think that's a great example of a positive effect because we want people finding the jobs that actually make the most sense for them, that pay the most, that they most enjoy, that most engaged by, not just a matter of taking the first job that you can find. New mothers extend their maternity leaves, and a common uh, finding is that birth weights increase. So you're looking at healthier babies, and of course that's a huge one if you look at generation after generation. If each generation is born healthier, that's a very incredible uh, effect. As far as education goes, yes, students focus on school, grades improve, uh, hospitalization rates declined 8.5% in Dauphin. Uh, in Namibia, crime was reduced by 42%, and uh, this is really, it, poaching was decreased by 95%. So it shows that there are certain crimes that people do that they would never otherwise do if they really didn't, if they felt they didn't have to do it. Homeownership rates increased in the American experiments. It's common that more fresh, fre more fresh fruits and vegetables are consumed. So people make healthier choices uh, when they can afford better food, better access to food. There's actually a slight decrease in alcohol and tobacco. This is a meta-analysis meta across many studies. And uh, the, the Great Smoky Mountain study of youth in North Carolina found some really interesting effects uh, through parents starting to receive a, uh, a dividend. And it showed that the kids' cognitive functioning improved led to fewer behavioral disorders, and actually changed their personalities. It increased their conscientiousness and agreeableness. Another common effect is that savings go up and debts go down, and a very common effect is self-employment goes up. Uh, experiment after experiment shows a, a marked increase in entrepreneurship. And in Alaska, part-time employment increased by 17% uh, since 1982. So just to zoom in a little bit on the Dauphin experiment, this went on for five years, was a negative income tax model. Uh, fascinating that hospitalization rates decreased. Um, but yeah, school attendance and performance improved. There was less domestic violence, and there were fewer health complaints. This was a, a result of less stress. And so if you look at the, the, the years, you can see a, a really interesting effect here where enrollments increased noticeably over the income years. In fact, it exceeded 100%. How did that happen? Well, people who had dropped out actually came back to finish. It turns out you had all these, say, high school students that because their parents weren't earning enough, they needed to earn money for the family. Once they started receiving a basic income guarantee, then they could actually focus on their educations instead of actually uh, selling their labor in the labor market. And just want to zoom in a bit uh, on the Great Smoky Mountain Study of Youth, too. And so this is a, a, a longitudinal poverty study where four years into the study, as some of the families started receiving dividends of around $4,000 per year, and they've been growing over time. So I think what's so interesting about this is that it increased personality traits that, that we actually want. Conscientiousness means you're, you're, you're going to lie less, there's greater focus. And agreeableness is uh, you're more likely to engage in uh, with others in teamwork. And the largest effects were on the most poor. Those had the, the, the biggest effect, and their parents actually, because of less stress, used less alcohol. So I just want to look at, you know, there is a, a strong socioeconomic, socioeconomic status effect uh, on the way they, that we think, and also, there's an effect on the brain itself in development. I think this is a, especially just a, a horrible finding to, to know that, that um, children's brains actually, their white matter develops less in severe poverty. And that effect goes away once they reach a certain amount, once their parents reach a certain amount of income. So we certainly want everyone to have a, a minimum amount of money to actually prevent that. And this actually can affect adults, too. It's almost like we have a, uh, like a, a program running in the back of our minds, and it's taking up space, this, this need for money to live. And it's actually been measured around 13, 
IQ points. So uh, imagine how many, uh, how much of a change that would make to society to remove that, that cognitive burden that's going on to allow people to focus more. And I think it's important to, uh, to look to what motivates us to work. There's two main ways here. There's intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation. Intrinsic motivation, you're motivated internally to do this. It's internal reasons. And it's actually a great motivator for creativity. The uh, extrinsic motivation, it's actually a great motivator for routine work, the same work that we're automating away and have been. And it actually inhibits creative task performance. So it's actually, we in this future of work, we want people to be more intrinsically motivated and not motivated by earning money. So if you look at this through like a Maslow's hierarchy of needs perspective, if we can cover people's security and survival, then they won't be engaged, they won't have to find these forms of work that they're not engaged by. They'll be able to just focus on the stuff that they are engaged by, be able to focus on the stuff that they really want to focus on. It's also important to understand that, that jobs is not work and is not meaning. I know people are worried that, oh, what's gonna happen when people lose their jobs, they're gonna lose their meaning. Uh, what point will they have to live if they don't have this 40 hour per week routine job to go to? But we need to understand that these are three separate things. You can have work that isn't a job. You can have meaning that isn't work. You can, it, I think what we want to have is, is, is the pursuit of meaning, meaningful work, and it's great that if it pays more too, but it also necessarily might be someone's greatest motivator. They don't want to do stuff for free without doing it paid. You know, just when you look at caring work. So I think the future we need to look at, not even STEM, I think that's a mistake. STEAM, we're, we're, it's, it's a mistake to cut out the arts. We need to really th create more human humans as we go into the future. So I think that we should look more like the four C's. We look at, people need to be taught creativity, how to think creatively. Critical thinking, I think, is extremely important. Again, at, at previous uh, presentations, like looking at, say, the, the fake news and the fake videos, you need to be able to figure out um, what is true and what isn't. You need to be able to work with each other, and you need to be curious. If that curious curiosity has a great effect on um, reducing partisanship. So if you're, if you, the more scientifically curious you are, then the more likely you are to look at opposing viewpoints and you're more likely to change your mind to those viewpoints. So I think the new goal should be to create people who are as unmachine-like as possible. We need to free people to, uh, to seek more than just money to live. I love this quote from Henry George in Progress and Poverty. In fact, MLK himself quoted this in his final book. The fact is that the work which improves the condition of mankind, the work which extends knowledge and increases power and enriches literature, and elevates thought is not done to secure living. It is not the work of slaves driven to their task either by the lash of a master or by animal necessities. It is the work of men who perform it for their own sake and not that they may get more to eat or drink or wear or display. In a state of society where want is abolished, work of this sort could be enormously increased. I think we should look about this as, again, this cognitive burden in the mind. You take out the need for money to live and to seek for that and the rest of it fills that space. You're able to focus on all these other things that are, we are currently unable to focus on. I think Buckminster Fuller said it best with this quote as far as the, what we should be doing in the future. We must do away with the absolutely specious notion that everybody has to earn a living. It is a fact today that one in 10,000 of us can make a technological breakthrough capable of supporting all the rest. The youth of today are absolutely right in recognizing this nonsense of earning a living. We keep inventing jobs because of this false idea that everybody has to be employed at some kind of drudgery because according to Malthusian Darwinian theory, he must justify his right to exist. So we have inspectors of inspectors and people making instruments for inspectors to inspect inspectors. The true business of people should be to go back to school and think about whatever it was they were thinking about before somebody came along and told them that they had to learn a living. Thank you.